Baker. All right. I'll give you a hug later. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Books on Magic. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Amali. I'm the events coordinator here at Books on Magic. So before we get started, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's going to go. First off, we do ask that you keep your mask on at all times while at this event. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end, so please start thinking of questions to ask. After the talk tonight, Nicole will be signing and personalizing books at the desk near the side door behind me. Um, we also have additional books available to purchase tonight. If you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of How You Get Famous online using the link in the live stream description. All right, so with all that in mind, we are very excited to introduce Nicole Pasulka, Mary Cherry, and Santiago Felipe, who are here celebrating the release of Nicole's debut book, How You Get Famous, 10 Years of Drag Madness in Brooklyn. takes a deep dive into the last decade of the Brooklyn drag scene through the personal narratives of iconic New York drag queens like Sasha Velour, Aja, and Mary Cherry, who we're so lucky to have with us tonight. This book weaves together an incredible tapestry of drama, messiness, the vitality of community, and the complexities of queer subcultures. Nicole Pasulka writes about gender activism and criminal justice for publications such as New York, Harper's, Mother Jones, Vice, and The Believer. The recipient of numerous prestigious fellowships, her writing has been anthologized in the Best American series and featured on NPR's All Things Considered. How You Get Famous is her first book. As I mentioned earlier, Mary Cherry and Santiago Felipe join Nicole in conversation tonight. A Brooklyn and downtown Manhattan drag legend, Mary Cherry has been pro proclaimed the mother of Brooklyn drag, a title she holds dear and takes seriously by feeding the children when they're hungry oh. and giving them a <laughs> healthy dose you of did that. fruit, <laughs> even if they aren't ready I for it. That. In true mother form, she tries to uplift and bring her community together with events throughout the year. In addition to Dragnet, she is the founder of the Brooklyn Nightlife Awards and is the main MC and host of Bushwig. She regular, regularly produces shows at Metropolitan Bar and is a regular panelist and performer at RuPaul's Drag Con. She's been an activist and leader in the BLM movement through her drag performance. Cuban photographer and director Santiago Felipe is based in Brooklyn, New York, both his muse and now home. Santiago is Bjork's official tour photographer and a sought after celebrity photographer for Getty Images who's hustled a throne for himself as the go-to performance artist photographer with a portfolio including Madonna, yep. Sia, and Billy Porter. He cut his artistic chops on the Brooklyn drag scene, inadvertently documenting the rise of Williamsburg now budding alt-nightlife. Alt -night Considered drag scene royalty, Santiago has been shooting drag stars like RuPaul's Drag Race Queens for the last 20 years. What incredible bios. So without any further delay, I'm going to pass it off to Nicole for a short reading. Yeah, okay. Is this? Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> me. Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, it's behind no, you. No. Yeah, there we go. Just wrap yeah. me up in sorry. it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, just going to read the introduction to Miss Mary Cherry um, oh and, my God, no. and then we're gonna cry a little bit and then we're gonna get on with it okay <laughs> on a chilly November evening in 2011 Jason Ruth was nursing a beer at Metropolitan in Brooklyn's Williamsburg neighborhood when one of the owners mentioned they needed someone to work coat check over the winter Jason perked up he had moved to New York City two years earlier from Berkeley, California, with two suitcases and three months of rent money, hoping to be somebody. He wasn't sure who exactly, but somebody. Now, at 28 years old, he found himself wasting his days in a windowless office, entering numbers into spreadsheets for a nonprofit alongside an overbearing boss and a bunch of uptight coworkers. 
He was living like a nobody in the most important place on earth, paying too much rent for too little space on Manhattan's Upper East Side. Even while people partied, screwed, and got rich all around him, Jason was friendless, bored, and broke. It changes, don't worry. It's fast. It sucked. Coat checks co seemed to step up, however small, plus he could use the money. In Berkeley, he'd been raised mostly by his grandmother, Ruth, who knew he liked boys but rarely talked about it. An only child, Jason spent a lot of time alone, imagining a world where people wanted to get to know him. In these fantasies, he lived on Long Island, a place he'd heard about on TV <laughs> <laughs> and belonged to the wealthiest black family in the world. Everyone was fascinated by his rich, stylish parents. Absolutely. And all of Jason's friends were rich and stylish, too. It's not fiction. No, it, it, that, <laughs> no that is... That, yeah, it, it, I'm just very exposed right now. Uh, you're, but you're, it's fine. Keep you're talking. giving everyone a gift, and you're doing amazing. Thank you. Keep living. You're welcome. Jason imagined that he had a twin sister, Jessica, who became a famous pop star after Michael Jackson overheard her singing in the bathroom and cast her in his video for Scream instead of Janet. <laughs> in reality, Jason's life was considerably lonelier. Once, when Jason was around 10, he put on his grandmother's slip intending to do a little show. His uncle walked in as Jason was mid-pirouette and made him change. As Jason got older, he got bigger, 200 mumble mumble pounds. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> and gayer, though he wasn't sure anyone could tell. Then, one day, Jason was hanging out with his cousin and their friends when he noticed they were watching him closely, studying him. Yes, his cousin said. Yes. No, 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 yes, yes. What are you doing? Jason asked. I'm saying when you're acting like a girl and when you're not, his cousin explained. Jason hadn't realized he seemed feminine to other people. He never really thought about his gender as a performance, a show. To fit in, he let his cousin coach him on how to be more manly. Overall, life wasn't bad. He got to go to summer camp and Disneyland and his grandmother loved him. But there were lots of crying and slam doors and frustration. In high school, he started going out with some cool kids, smoking weed and downing beers. He went away to school in Boston, but was kicked out for partying. He moved back in with Grandma Ruth and went out every night. Once, he was so confused and foggy from all the partying, he left the house for that night's adventure wearing two different shoes. <laughs> he was suffocating in his grandmother's small, cluttered house. She knew it, too. One day when he was 26 years old, he came home after yet another night, spent dancing until 5 in the morning. I love you for staying with me, Grandma Ruth said, but you need to live your life. But what was his life? Jason loved fashion, celebrities, and money. He had always dreamed about living in the biggest city with the baddest, most important people. Soon after he arrived in New York, he reconnected with the rich girl he'd met studying graphic design in San Francisco. She and her friends were the kind of people Jason wanted to be around. The kind who regularly spent one thousand five I can't believe what fifteen hundred dollars on bottle crazy. service crazy in a nightclub and vacation in the Caribbean when the weather got cold. Yeah. <laughs> Not I wasn't with them, but they were. <laughs> but, I watched that, their house. But that was but wasn't that their loss though? I mean, yeah, no. Yeah, not, no. seriously. With the Hamptons. Yeah. That's that's I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Jason soon fell into a routine. After work, he'd go to Metropolitan and Williamsburg for happy hour. He discovered it after fleeing some terrible bar full of straight people playing video games in the arcade. <laughs> he ran three blocks in the pouring rain and entered a dingy room full of sparkling, sexy gay men dancing to insane. At Metropolitan, he'd have a couple of beers most nights and then end up in Manhattan clubbing with his posh friends. It was a borrowed glamour, but it was glamorous nonetheless. For his birthday, they had taken him for drinks at the Jane Hotel in the West Village. He wore a silk canary yellow button-down shirt, a gauzy blue fascinator, and a swipe of eyeshadow. The music was good, and so he lost all six foot four inches of his gay self on the dance floor. As he danced, a crowd slowly collected around him. There was no one who looked like him in the club, and he could sense that people were taking pictures. 
It was the same feeling he'd had when he burst into spontaneous song and dance numbers at summer camp. He loved people's eyes on him, to see that he was making them laugh, but he didn't know how to hold their attention for longer than a song or a joke. He thought he was special, but he didn't know what to do about it. He sometimes danced or showed off while waiting for the bus. Many people told me this, by the way. To try to get people to pay attention to him, and because he believed dancing made the bus come faster. But that was hardly a talent. While Jason was scheming on how to rise up in the world, everything came crashing down. One night, he was so sloppy done, he pissed off his friend's boyfriend. They stopped inviting him to the clubs. Suddenly, he had no crew, no bottle service, and very little money. What he did have, though, was Metropolitan. Metro, as it's known to locals, was the biggest, busiest gay bar in Brooklyn. Windowless on a residential street, it welcomed Jason with open arms. During the week, regulars gathered at the bar at the pool table. In summer, chatty groups of gay men and lesbians ate burgers and smoked cigarettes in the massive backyard. It was a dive, not a destination. And after a few months, the other regulars knew Jason's name, asked about his day and his grandmother's health, and brought him beers. As he plotted his return to the splendor of Manhattan nightlife, Jason took refuge among his fellow salty queers. That winter, four evenings a week, Jason hung coats and handed out tickets. He didn't make a lot of money, but he met so many people, some of them celebrities, like clothing designer Alexander Wang. He was offered so many drugs. He loved it. He, oof, sorry, sorry. Oof, oof. He was still a nobody, but the proximity to fame and the pills and powders made him feel one step closer to being somebody. In the Bay Area, Jason had sometimes dressed in drag for house parties and made people call him... Jacqueline Baptiste. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun, he started showing up to work, coat check with a shimmery arch painted across his eyelids. Ooh, you're wearing eyeshadow. I love it. People cooed <laughs> as they handed him their coats and left noticeably bigger tips. You like this? Jason thought to himself. How about I become wearing lipstick, too? One night before he went to the bar, Jason had a friend do his makeup, and an hour into his shift, a very drunk woman tipped him $50. Real money. This is something I could get into, Jason realized. <laughs> and from then on, he always wore coat check and makeup. Over the course of the winter, he added a wig, a tiny top hat, a bright red boa, and an obscene amount of glitter to his look. One night, Jason ran into a guy he'd slept with a few months earlier. Hello, Mary Cherry. The man came over to greet him with his coat. Mary Cherry, Jason asked. The man laughed. I don't remember your name, but you were wearing red the last time I saw you, and you just seemed so happy, so I think of you as Mary Cherry. Jason waved his hand in front of the man, yes, and made a motion to snatch some imaginary object. I'm taking that name, he announced. Jason began introducing himself as Mary Cherry whenever he went out. The handle was both sincere. He was merry and satirical. Mary being a long-standing term of endearment and sometimes ridicule among gay men. <coughs> he thought it was the perfect drag name. Spring was approaching and with it, the end of coat check. But Jason wasn't ready to go back to being a bored regular trapped in a day job and he certainly didn't want to give up the extra cash. Jason thought of how much more excited people were when he wore makeup and a wig. <coughs> in his final week, he cornered one of the bar's owners and pitched him an idea. He wanted to host a drag competition. The owner looked doubtful. Sometimes drag queens came in to meet up with friends after a gig in Manhattan, but there were no drag shows at Metropolitan. The New York City drag queen had waxed and waned in size and popularity over the past hundred years. In some eras, shows had been wild, in others artfully restrained. Performances popped up in dive bars, nightclubs, dance halls, and theaters, but there had never been much drag in Brooklyn. In 2012, most shows took place at well-established Manhattan gay bars, where a group of experienced performers and promoters determined who was good, who got booked, and who got paid. But Jason was adamant. His secret talent, he'd realized, was getting people to pay attention to him, on the dance floor, at the bar, even while hanging up their coats. If he could entertain eat that easily, then why couldn't he draw a crowd to Brooklyn for a drag show? Jason pushed and prodded, and the owner relented. You have one chance, he said, but if this isn't successful, it's going to be a one-time thing. He agreed to give Jason $100 to host and organize, $100 to pay a DJ, and $50 bucks for the winner. Jason left Metro and walked out into a cool spring night, a queer man in the early years of a new millennium, in search of the holy trinity of show business. 
Steady money, good times, and a stage. I love that quote, by the way. Ah. Okay. Yeah, that, that was great. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I realized as I was reading that 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 was a lot. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh my god, I just met some of most of these people, but it's fine. Right. Uh, and also, that was like three years ago <laughs> that we talked, so I forgot well, how much. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I knew it was because I read it, so I mean, I knew it was all coming, but yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. Hi. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> Mary Cherry, everybody. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, this is Santiago Felipe, and he did has been photog photographing the drag scene for ages right yeah at least uh, more than 10 years i don't know i kind of it was just one of those i had moved to new, i had moved hello i had moved to new york and uh my thing was always shooting concerts and stuff like that and at the time you know i was living in my uh hometown of miami florida and i remember i thought i was i was, I was talking to my editor in miami for the it was Miami New Times, and I told her, well, I'm going to move to New York, I'm going to shoot concerts, and she laughed at me, <laughs> and, and I, I get it why she laughed at me, because it's really hard to, like, you know, especially moving to New York to, to I don't know, have a, a, I guess starting out. She thought you couldn't hack it. Hack it, yeah. But so, while doing, like, retail and all that stuff, I stumbled, you know, I'm just, like, I'm about, and uh, it was my early 20s, so I just come out as well, and I was exploring just I guess New York nightlife, and I was always ha I would always hang out at Sugarland, which was like the only like gay bar, and uh, that's sort of how what kind of how things steamrolled because like you know there were there was, there was only like I you could only you could count them in the palm of your hand how many drag queens it was like like five or six at the time in Brooklyn in Brooklyn yeah. and that's how I just started out. I just would hang out with them and I would bring my camera. After working my date, my my retail job <laughs> at the time, you know. How did so, you all meet? <laughs> oh, so Mary, I, I, there was a point where I was, um, for the heck of it, was a friend who throw these theme parties in Brooklyn, and I was hanging a flyer at Metropolitan Bar. And so for me, my <laughs> thing is always like talk to everyone because you never know what can happen, you know. So I saw him putting up the poster. Yeah, she was like kind of, kind of like that. That moment when, when Hillary was speaking and Trump was behind her. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she has, Mary, Mary has this look that when she's like going for the kill, she had a drink in her hand. And she's kind of, you know, but it took, she, you know, we started talking and actually we ended up like raging that night. Yeah, had a good, really good time. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think just, you know, that's how the friendship sort of blossomed. But what year was that, Mary? Um, that was 2012. I, uh, so, yeah. So, so yeah, so I've, been, that's, I've been shooting. Our, 2011. 2000, I don't even think I did Dragnet. I started Dragnet yet. Yeah, I, I believe I moved to New York around 2009 or something. Oh, I didn't. No, I met you in the 11. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, shooting, photographing drag queens for a minute, just because, I don't know, I stumbled upon it. Yes, and I never went to Sugarland. I was in Metropolitan. There was nothing going on at Metropolitan at that time when it came to drag queens. Sugarland had already kind of, uh, the girls there kind of put the stake down for the, we own this, you know? Uh, but also, I will add that uh, the few queens that existed at Sugarland were the only queens in Brooklyn really doing much. There we go. That's um, right. But... They left and went to Manhattan because Manhattan was paying. And so instead of, they kind of just left Brooklyn to fit for itself when it comes to drag culture. And that's kind of when um, myself, Horchata, um, stepped in. In my opinion, this is how I will tell the story. Okay? Yeah, yeah. tell your, tell Yeah, because I mean, yes. some of the girls will be like, we were you were here for once a week, excuse me, <coughs> once a week for a gig, and like, what other parts besides Sugarland were you at? You know, when I started my movement, moving and shaking, I was not just at Metro, I was at afters, I was at other people's parties at random 
all straight bars. I just had a gay night. I was moving around. You were and out not, every night. I was, I was out. I was an alcoholic. I'm still an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. But yeah. When did you realize that you had like a scene though? When did you, from both of you, like when were you like, oh, this is really something in Brooklyn? Because I moved to Brooklyn in 2002 and there was no drag. And then 2012, uh, 2013, suddenly there was, it was everywhere. For me, it all kind of was like, all happened so quickly, and I was just having a good time with my friends, really, to be honest. I wasn't trying to do anything but just have a good time and create some good memories. I was in my uh, late 20s, going into my 30s, and uh, yeah, like, I just wanted to get sucked up, <laughs> you but know, when, but to be when honest. were you like, oh, this is some Brooklyn drag? It was, it was so much later when, yeah. to be honest, and I actually told, I saw him recently, this guy came up to me that I had been working with for at least two years, and uh, it just came out in conversation. He was like, oh, I knew you three years before I actually met you. And I'm like, what? Mm. And at first I was just like, stalker! <laughs> uh, but then uh, he explained himself no. more, and... I guess he found a photo of me at some club uh, in Manhattan, like some lady fag party or something, yeah. and started following me on Facebook or something like that. So you were famous? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'll take it, you know. I worked hard, you know. For me, now that you mentioned I, I feel I could kind of pinpoint it. It was somewhere <laughs> around season four, season five of Drag Race where all these drag started coming up and it's funny um, you know between some of my girls we would because uh, I feel like the kids kind of came in waves like you knew who moved to the city and I remember when kind of Mary's crew kind of started taking over with a fellow drag queen friend we, you know we <laughs> they call them uh, poopy diapers <laughs> or GPKs garbage pill kids the yeah. Brooklyn, because, the because, Brooklyn the Manhattan the Brooklyn Mary's poopy this, diapers. you know Mary call, yeah. we'll call it Brooklyn drag because it was just sort of, you know, experimental. But like, <laughs> what is, but, like, what is that for those who Okay, well, know? I'm just, I'm sorry. Um, so, yes, uh, and, yes, it's Manhattan Drag, Brooklyn Drag, Brooklyn Drag. If you Google Brooklyn Drag Queens, um, we're Googleable. Manhattan, <laughs> Manhattan, literally, it's just what party they're doing. So, um, in Brooklyn, drag is legend. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh -huh. They do yeah. like little sh yeah. cute shows. That's cute. Okay, we're part of culture. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I mean, we're in Brooklyn. I don't think anyone's gonna come for you. I mean, yeah, no, that. but it's also factual. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it is like you can just really look it up. Yeah. But yes, they're all uh, the dra Manhattan Drag Race has more popularity with getting on. Or Manhattan drag queens have more popularity with getting on Drag Race. Which, good for you, make that money. But uh, now that I'm not ever going to go on the show, um, <laughs> I can honestly say that I actually now I'm truly okay with like being a part of this like weird culture that exists in queer Brooklyn. Well, well I want to add. Uh, I feel like the show at that point opened up like the visibility of kids dressing up. And, but sure. the, and to add, the joke about Brooklyn drag was, you know, if you like Mary said, you could Google it. Especially her old photos, uh, you know. Oh, like, oh, look them up. Look them up. You know, clock the archives. Archives. Clock the flip flops. Clock the flip flops. Oh, the flip -flops. Clock, 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 oh the is this a reading <laughs> session now? It's we can go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. But, uh, it but won't I mean, be that type of thing. That's, that's what I meant. It was very experimental. The kids would just like, dress up, and it was for a good time. It was performance art. It was messy. Yeah, it was very it was messy. Great. Yeah, but I yeah, love like, it. the queens that were kind of before you could tell, you know, they were kind because of, you know. They, that you're, you're coming for the gig. Oh, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then also so you have to... entertaining to watch that. That's all I got. You have to... I, I agree with you. But then if you go even further back and see those queens that are, like, calling us garbage pills, because, you know, uh -huh. I have a, a feeling about it. Um, <laughs> they looked crazy, too, five years before. I think they meant it as a compliment. That's... No, they didn't. Think. No, 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 That's no, very no. cute of you. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's, 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 the garbage... That's, the poopy diapers, maybe not, but the garbage pail was definitely... There was some salty, amount they, of... Was that good things? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, fair enough. But, so, Brooklyn Drag. Poopy diapers, garbage pail, messier, more fun, though, kind of, like... Oh, my God, so much fun. more fun. I mean... I didn't even care about polish. I just 
had a fucking gay time. Yeah. I've like once sometimes when I'm ever feeling down about myself, I literally just go back on my Facebook photos and just see the amazing life that my ancestors have laid out for me. And um, yeah, I'm proud, honored, and I try to live up to what I've been given yeah. as much as possible yeah. and still get a little messy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk about the mess a little bit or have we, <laughs> have we trotted through your mess enough? I, it's in the book, isn't it? Like, it, is. <laughs> like, it is. Yeah, we I'm can, a party girl. Like, we whatever, can make you him know. read the book or you can. Yeah, I mean, yeah, what, what do you want to talk about? No, we were going to talk about the hard times. Okay. Because there are hard times. Like, yes. it's not I mean, hard you ask the questions, though, because that's their job. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will answer them. Okay, so you talk about mess. But, yeah. like, also nightlife is rough, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell the people a little bit about the ways in which it's been difficult for you? I mean, I. do you want to ask me the question? What, what Like, what do you want to talk? Just, you can ask me whatever. I was asking, I mean, you had, I know you had a stroke. They don't know. Oh, but you want to talk about, okay, because I'm like, that's not a mess, but I thought you meant no, like no, the no, drug no, 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 the drugs, the drugs. Okay, yeah, I yeah. use drugs. <laughs> 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 I use a lot of them. <laughs> a lot, a lot. <laughs> um, and I mean, you're probably the only person in this room. <laughs> I'm sure. But no, so like. what is that like? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like. I definitely was like <laughs> wild for a moment and it just was cocaine was like it's my holy trinity is what I called it it was um a share joint with like two pe no more than two people um about five lines of cocaine and four shots accompanied with a beer and that was like I was good for the night <laughs> party <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I and so I just recently came back home and I started making my home like a real home recently and I was thinking about before COVID I was doing nightlife for 10 years before that and I thought about all the times I stayed home and I totaled that in 10 years of living and being in nightlife I stayed home seven a total of seven days <laughs> <laughs> um, so I literally was out every night. If it wasn't my gig, it was a friend's gig, I was supporting. If it wasn't a friend's gig, I was at the gig talking shit about the bitch. Uh, in the back of that, <laughs> that messy hoe. Wait, can everyone hear me without the mic? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, sorry. Uh, People are live streaming. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Cool. see the hat, but they don't know what you're saying. Okay, cool. Uh, this is probably good for the yes. drunk talk. But yeah, so where was I? Uh, it's gonna sound sarcastic, but you were talking about your dedication to nightlife. I mean, was it dedication or obsession slash uh, addiction? But you know, whatever. I was fabulous. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. This is not judgment coming yeah, from I me. Mean, I feel like this was the, a thing that fed you and fueled you. I. It was a community for me, and I. I loved. So there were nights that I. No, I'm not even gonna tell that lie. I was gonna be like, there are nights I didn't drink. <laughs> I think there was like three, um, but that crazy life of drinking, smoking cigarettes, um, being overweight, uh, sm smoking weed as well because it does raise your blood pressure, not getting enough sleep, and I think the night I had my stroke, um, or the morning I had my the night be the morning before I had my stroke, I called my dealer three times, so that was like. <laughs> That was the height of it. <laughs> of the, she had issues, I guess. But um, I woke up and my hand was not right. And then um, eventually after a few visits to the hospital, realized that I had a stroke and kind of changed my direction a little bit. But I still, after like four months, still started going out a little bit more, but not as much. But uh, yeah. Yeah, the stroke kind of changed things, which also changed how I saw other people in nightlife a little bit. Um, saw the real, who was real and who wasn't and all that shit. But uh, I'm actually very grateful to have the stroke because I don't think I would have been able to live if I kept going the way I was going. Well, and I kind of think that, you know, it became just 
yeah, a way for you to reassess. Yeah, and I'm pissed as hell because I started doing cocaine again because I thought it would help me lose weight, and uh, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Santiago. <laughs> uh, from, actually, from years of no, don't worry, I'm not coming for you. <laughs> uh, I, I actually uh, an observation from years of shooting nightlife. I feel like nightlife. Uh, if you're not careful, you do you will spiral because mm -hmm. people just hand you like. Um, I, I don't I don't go as hard as I used to, but I was working a party um, a couple uh, about two weeks ago on a Sunday, and I was making a joke that I kid you not like. I must have been offered like cocaine like five times mm -hmm. and like and and drinks and I you know it's messy and I'm like where were you years ago no but <laughs> but uh, yeah and unfortunately actually um, over the last couple of months a lot of like young kids who who are who were hosts have I mean you, the, 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 it's, you don't see it out there in the internet but have unfortunately passed away due to. You know, overdosing. Months, like the last, like, the, like last week. I mean, it's it's just, yeah. So it's it, 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 nightlife. There's lots of cool stuff about nightlife, but I, again, if you're not careful, like you end up spiraling and you get caught up. Yeah. And just perfect example, I had this guy uh, maybe a few months before COVID. I he offered me cocaine and. I like to make people feel a little awkward <laughs> when they offer me cocaine now. And you're like, are and you I'm trying like, to kill me? Yeah, yeah. and I'm just like, I had a stroke. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry. And normally <laughs> it gets really awkward and I kind of laugh inside. But um, <laughs> I'm a little dark. Um, but then this one guy, I was like, yeah, I had a stroke. And instead of being like, oh my God, he was like, oh yeah, I had four. And I was like, <laughs> my God, girl. <laughs> I was like, I definitely don't want your shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Choice, it's a good choice. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it is a weird balance, right? Like, we love to go out, we find a lot of joy, you get your life, but some people go too far. So, how do you balance all of your amazing... Entertainment photography oh. with nightlife. I, I, I've been sober for a bit now. Oh, I so, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it, it comes with age, I guess. I'm like, what am I doing? But um, yeah, I, I just think that I've gotten tired of it, and you, you just feel like you just waste your day the next, and you don't bounce back like you used to either. So I kind of just like I drink water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, um, this yeah. is like a real late thirties vibe. <laughs> <laughs> I feel yeah. Uh, which, I, I, again, uh, I'm kind of grateful, like, caught on, and I'm like, what I'm, you know, I've moved on from that. But you were doing, you were out in the clubs photographing and also doing Billy Porter and doing oh, yeah, yeah. tour photography at the same time. I mean, like, did those things work in tandem? It worked, because, uh, well, now I'm tour, so for a while, I, for about a year, I did follow Billy Porter doing, uh, like, all the award season stuff, and it just, I guess it, it worked out magically where you know i would go on tour with miss b and when i would come back it would be like award season so i would leave with billy mm -hmm. and i guess it's just like a new york habit that you know work is work so i don't you know cool baby shower sure <laughs> as long as you're paying oh you know shooting a rodeo good, let's yeah. do it <laughs> uh so yeah like so I, I just i don't know again it, i don't know if it's like a new york habit that when even though when i have free time i try to like find work you know uh but yeah with getty images I, when, whatever it is, I'm free, I'm like, cool, I'm open for assignments, just send me anything. So it's just, no, no gig is too big or small, <laughs> I guess you could say, you know? But, uh, yeah. That's something that I value. I th feel that the younger girls are performer, art, performing artists, DJs, whatever, um, they, the sense of, because I worked for nothing at my first party, and now I remember... Five years ago, I offered this girl a free DJ set. She wanted a DJ. I was like, I'll pay you 50 bucks. We'll pay for your car there. And you can get yourself a sandwich afterwards. She never DJed ever. And I was like, you can DJ for a whole hour on um, the beginning of my party. And she had, in my opinion, had the nerve to ask for more money <laughs> two days before the event. And I'm just like, girl, you've never DJed. Like, and I'm already paying you something. And for, you know, you get... 
you know, obviously get what you're worth, but at the same time, I come from the school of, you know, you... Uh, you gotta pay your dues. Yeah, you gotta pay your dues, yeah, for totally. sure. Totally. I think that's very relatable. Yeah, well, you know, some of, some of these kids out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. And they're like, oh, Mary Cherry hit somebody. I'm like, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> what was the reason? Okay. <laughs> was that the, was that an answer to the question you're you're asking? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, that, Absolutely. <laughs> I trail off sometimes. If they don't, so I'm like, you if they really don't like what you're offering, just hit them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <it's> great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're wrapping it up. Are we going to take questions? Oh yeah. Questions. Okay. We're going to okay. take questions. If you guys have questions. If you don't, that's okay too. We can, talk we can just go more. to the bar and do shots. Oh, is there a bar? There could be. Not oh, here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes? What brought you to the place that you were like, this is what I want to write about? Or or not, like, how did you come to be like, this is a book I'm going to write? This is a, that's a good question. I think the thing for me that I had been watching happen through the 2000s was that gay shit was getting more and more popular. And... I could sometimes predict why, but I sometimes couldn't. And when suddenly, and I think we forget about this, right? Like in 2016, 2015, like suddenly drag was this thing that everyone was talking about, where previously it had been this thing that gay people knew about or some, some people were really into, but like Drag Race blew up, RuPaul was on every magazine, and I was like, that's weird but it didn't make me want to look at it from the from like that perspective it made me curious about what that really meant for performers and people living day to day you know and I think also just like those stories are always best told through getting as close as you can to the experiences that people have. So I think it was like a mix of knowing that there was this vibrant thing going on in Brooklyn, but also knowing that there was this spotlight on it in an, at a national sense and feeling <coughs> that like maybe I could kind of dig into why suddenly people liked gay people, you know, some people. Like whereas it had been previously like, and we didn't, we all had amnesia about that, right? That it used to be something that people really judged and hated. Um, and I wanted to like just sift through that so drag gives me life and i had thought that that was like a much smaller experience like a much more general like local experience than it was and so i wanted to understand what other people were getting out of it yeah. actually i want you i got reminded of something i <coughs> i remember again it was around <coughs> season four or five and uh i would tell like people at prs or music, the music industry people mm -hmm. would see my photos of like drag queen portraits and they would tell me, like, why is that on your website? That's bad. You should take that down. People won't take you serious. And I, I, I have the emails. And because I even, I would kind of help, help style some of the girls. And these designers would not let drag queens wear, like, designer clothes. So it's crazy how the visibility, again, I, the drag race, it blew up the scene. And now like, there's, like, drag queens on everything, which is awesome. But, yeah, it was really kind of frowned upon around that time, very early on. And I think that I give all the props to RuPaul personally because uh, RuPaul, in my opinion, uh, so many people that I love, our lives would not be what it is today if it wasn't for RuPaul. And people try to take things like, guess what? We are not perfect, you know? And the more money you make, the less perfect you probably are going to be, you know? And But at the end of the day, that man deserves every fucking flower in the world, in my opinion, because, I mean, for me, especially as a black man, it is so important for me to have uh, a figure like that. And, you know, I don't got Bill Cosby no more, so it's just like, <laughs> you ain't taking no more from me, bitch, like, you know, so, like, you know, so... <laughs> Frack away, bitch! Frack away! Okay. As if he's the only. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, yeah. They're fracking around the corner from my house right now, and I live in Williamsburg. <laughs> <laughs> they literally are fracking. Yeah, okay, just make sure everyone knows that. Okay. Anybody else?
anybody else? Yes. Um, just going off of like what you all just answered, and the question is like for for all or any. Um, do you feel like after what you just spoke of, like, do you think like drag is just gonna be a fad five, ten years from now? It's just gonna fade away, or is drag here to stay? A million dollar question. I think it's here to stay. Yeah. I think so much creativity has come, especially you may see like all the young kids, so young, like just like expressing themselves. So I think it's, oh, what was that? Everyone's going to be gay, <laughs> probably. <laughs> what was that? What was that lady that, that said that straight people were going to be extinct? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. What? Who looks like? Yeah. Do we, is there a plan for that? Can no. Donate to Great. <laughs> <Don't laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I think uh, in, in a couple of years from now, I, I think it's awesome that people are expressing themselves visually. Yeah, it's weird. Drag was huge in the 90s, right? Which I think is something that people forget about. That, like, Too Wong Fu, RuPaul had a single. There was this, re they were on talk sh drag queens were on talk shows. A lot of drag queens who are still working today. And it kind of dropped off in the early 2000s. But what I see now is, like, that it's just become a thing, a name that you can call gender experimental performance, which I just cannot see people ever getting tired of like what we think of as drag might change but like i think it's really it feels i mean i'm biased but it feels really entrenched to me at this point i don't know what do you think um yeah i'm not going anywhere so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean uh regardless of what because i've been going through a lot of different changes mentally and uh even if i don't want 10 years from now want to be at the metropolitan put in a drag show <laughs> Um, I definitely see myself owning a venue where the next girl can put on a drag show for the next people coming up, something like that. I, you know, I, I've always said whatever I do, drag is going to be a part of that. So just yeah. stay tuned, I guess. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Yes. Anybody else? Any other? Oh, here's a question for all of you. What, what advice do you give to people who are interested in, in your world of art and, and your creativity? Like, what, what would you say to people uh, coming up or trying to get involved? That's such, because I, I get a lot of people asking, like, oh, like, you know, um, what advice do I give to someone that wants to, you know? And man, I, I mean, I don't want to say it was luck, because I, I, I did, like, bust my ass and, you know, and kind of like Mary, I would go on about to any parties. And I, 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 would, I would always bring my camera, and uh, I kind of worked. Um, I, I, I very early on when I, lived, when I moved to New York, I ran a music blog, and that's how I would get like photo passes to concerts. So I was building my portfolio that way, and I, man, I would say I just kind of kept on. I mean, I feel like I would see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes it would just be, it, it was kind of, I guess how I would describe it, sort of like a fog and a light. So, you know, just keep going, keep hustling. Because an example, how I ended up touring with Bjork was her assistant, James Mary, many moons ago. I was freelancing for Patricia Fields at her store on, where was it, East Village? Mm -hmm. I was shooting I for her. Yeah, and RuPaul had just released a line of uh, sixteen-inch heels. I remember. Yeah, and uh, it was at her store, and so James Mary was there just partying. Um, we, I took a photo of him. We we hung out for a bit, and you know, fast forward, I just like had that connection. I, I didn't know that he was like her assistant at the time, and it was just one of those things that we re we re reconnected <coughs> years later. <coughs> and uh, I got invited to show on the shows, and things kind of steamrolled. But you see, that was a connection I made just out and about, mm -hmm. not with no intentions of like, a word, I don't know. Like, yeah. It was destined. It was, well, I, guess, also, I guess, it was you destined. You kept yeah. fucking doing it. Yeah. You did it, like, without, when, it, when, the, when the recognition wasn't there, when the money wasn't there. Yeah, I feel like. still showing up. Yeah, I just was, I don't know, man, just be out there and don't be a dick and do a good job. <laughs> you can be a dick later on when you no, create that no, status. No, no. Then you can hit people. Yeah. <laughs> After you've had a stroke, you can hit also, people. Also, um, um, I've never just like go around hitting people, but if you accidentally get slapped, you know, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, oh yeah, but uh, I one thing I stuck to examples. I don't think if it wasn't for photographing like drag queens and performers, that was the one thing I feel that Bjork saw. Like, oh, I love how he photographs like the girls in the costumes and the hair and the makeup, and and, that was, and people were telling me not to do that. So I think sticking your guns to what you love doing and just doing it regardless, because you have a passion for it. You know, hopefully, you know the laws of attraction will. I don't know, bring that. Yeah, I, know, I agree. It's, yeah. So, well, I think yeah. things, doing what you like <laughs> just because you like it and because you think you can be good at it, and then just, that's real. like that, people see that and they respond to that. Okay. And like you can develop, you can get other people interested in what you're doing too. Nicole. My makeup was definitely worse than some of the first people that competed for Dragnet. Okay? But the difference was, is I was the one that got to the manager, and the manager and I worked together. And even to this day, there are girls where I'm just like, damn, bitch, what'd you do? They're like, I've been doing it for five hours. No, I have money to make, I have things to do, I'm not going to be doing my makeup for five hours. But hooray for you, you look great. Uh, and thank you so much for being a part of my show. Uh, and maybe that's what they like, and they're... Like, I mean, yeah. diving into that. You it, know? Yeah, because, you know, a lot, a lot of the girls who I find that are great with makeup, I find are usually not good on the mic. But at the end of the day, I think... <laughs> what? Is that Shane? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, you just have your... <laughs> Most dancing queens. <laughs> Those girls, try to get them on the mic. And you'll be like, take the mic away. Okay? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and then, um, but coming out is just so important. I feel, and yes, it created a chaotic, crazy person, but going out and just meeting every, I've met everyone you could think of in nightlife by just going out and kikiing, and I feel that my life would have been very different if I did it just on the weekends or uh, sporadically, you know, and that's where all the connections are and the relate you create those relationships, you know. So yeah. regardless when people are like, Oh, I need this, they just saw me out last night. Yeah. Mary Cherry, are you busy? You know, kind of thing. Totally committed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I would say otherwise. But now at thirty eight, I would not do that. So I'm glad I was twenty seven and started going out. Because I would have been like, oh, Lord, because I like to, like, cook. <laughs> I like to cook and, like, Period. listen to music and, like, talk to f friends on the phone. <laughs> but then I don't get it twisted, though, because she's out and about, but Thursday through Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> but the other, uh, and then maybe not Thursday all the time, but I still got to get it in, though. You do. And I'm being paid. Yeah. Just, okay, yeah. thank you, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we All have right, one cool. more. Um, I'm so excited to see you. And I mean, I read the book, and you're like such a star. Um, can you tell the story of, of hitting someone? You've like, keep, you're keeping oh, 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 this, oh, is, this is a, yeah. this is a journalist. I didn't, I don't know why they let me in. <laughs> Where is that? That's not, I'm supposed to be the only one. Wait a minute, is there a story of you hitting someone in the book? You just remember. referenced it several oh, times. Oh, yeah, I know, but it's not there in the book. There is no story of you hitting no. someone in okay, the book. Okay, good. I, just, That's your I haven't own. finished the book yet, so I was like, my God. Also, I didn't hit anyone in those things. I just poured drinks on people back then. When I met you, you yeah. told me, I never put my hands on someone, because then you lose all the... Yeah. But something has shifted. Recently, I did... Yeah, recently I slapped someone, but it was just because... Well, first off, what do they do is, should be your next <laughs> Okay. But it's because um, the book I know ends me getting all Dragula, which <coughs> which was a bittersweet moment. And um, after the show aired when I was on it, I got a lot of hate from people online because they said I was a misogynist, which is the craziest thing I've ever heard. But one of the only girls in New York actually jumped on that bandwagon and after six months of me seeing her post I saw her for the first time about uh, two months ago and I 
<clears throat> at first I wasn't going to say anything and keep the high road and be like, I'm better than you anyway. But then she smirked at me, and so... <laughs> I'm a triple cancer, so I <laughs> kind of lost it. Um, and was just like, fuck you, fuck you, bitch, fuck you, fuck you. And poured a drink on me, and then I slapped her. <laughs> so was the slap deserved? Okay. <laughs> like, I got a few yes. Okay. <laughs> That's all I needed. The rest of you fuck yourselves. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. So that's. Um, but that was only. That's like a small little thing. But you know, at the end of the day, what I realized, and this is a part of the show, when you continue building your name, there's going to be more and more people that are going to come for you, and I need to actually make myself stronger to prepare for that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't mess with the cancer because I still haven't forgotten it. <laughs> Dragula, for those who don't know, is like a horror-themed drag competition show, kind of like Drag Ra Race. Mm -hmm. um, and Mary, Mary got an edit. I don't think it was the most... It was not a great edit. No, and I don't think it was the fairest edit. And <coughs> you... you, ha you you got the thing that people get when they go on TV and get an unfair edit, which is yeah. a whole bunch of people who didn't fucking know you, assuming that they, from what they saw on TV, was you. But now I'm so happy with it because what I have planned for the next three years, um, it's just like a great part of the storyline. So it's just, you know, I would say shows 24-7. So it's just That's continuing that, baby. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. We get it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Santiago, for this wonderful conversation. Thank, Thank you. you to everyone who asked such titillating questions. If you enjoyed the conversation, we have more copies available to purchase where you checked in. If you're still online with us, you can buy it at the, in the link in the video description. How much is it? It is twenty seven ninety nine, oh. <laughs> I believe. Um, Nicole will be personalizing books at the desk by the side door. We ask that you give her a couple minutes to get settled or so. But then once you've got your book, we ask that you do make your way downstairs so that our event staff can start to rearrange the space. <laughs> That's all for me. Let's give everyone a little round of applause.